Family greetings in the wonderful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We trust that you are well and blessed. This week, as you know, from tomorrow through the entire week, we prepare for our Easter weekend, and, and this week is known as Holy Week. And our prayer focus for this week, family, every morning we'll be releasing a scripture, and we want to focus on the power of the blood of Jesus. Amen. And we know that there's tremendous power in the blood of Jesus as we begin to pray from tomorrow for the entire week we trust in God that come the Easter weekend that something significant and something supernatural will be released over our lives and into our lives and God will shift us to a new dimension so I encourage you to prepare your hearts and get ready for a significant Easter weekend in Jesus name amen now we're going to continue on our our study this morning and we, uh, our series we've been dealing with from December is Living in Eden, and it's been an amazing journey for us. Our anchor verse is found in Psalm 36, reading verses 8. It reads, All may drink of the anointing from the abundance of your house. All may drink their full from the delightful springs of Eden. And so God's desire and God's heart is that your house, whether it be your body, which is the temple of the living God, the house in which you dwell in, or whether it be your physical home, that God wants your home to be a home of abundance. And, and a house of abundance speaks of the environment or the atmosphere. And God wants your, the atmosphere of your home to be a home where people, as they come into your home, they can sense the joy, they can sense the peace, they can sense that, that God resides in your home. And, and where God resides, I'll tell you something, family, He will always anoint you to the point or the level of overflow. And so we trust in God that even through this challenging time, that God will show himself strong on your behalf. Now, we've been studying Genesis chapter 2 from verse 10 through to verse 14. And we've been, we're looking at the strategy on how we could live in Eden. And we found that there are four rivers there, and we've been through the first three rivers. We started last week with the fourth river, which is the river Euphrates. And the, word, the river Euphrates is, a, is an amazing river. The word Euphrates means break forth. It means breakthrough, but it also means rushing. Amen. And, and we begin to see that God's desire uh, is as you go on a journey of becoming, that you get to a level where God will begin to release some supernatural exploits in and through your life. And we really believe that that's where we are. We're at the stage where we can sense that we, we are at a tipping point. And, and we've done what we needed to do, but I really believe, and I prophetically declare this over our lives, that, that at this tipping point, God is going to release us into a new dimension, into something significant, and uh, manifest His goodness in and through our lives. Now, when you study the Bible, the Bible says in many scriptures that, uh, for example, in Isaiah 58, verses 8, the Bible says there, your healing shall spring forth speedily. 
when you go to John 5, verse 8, the Bible says, And immediately the man was made whole. Matthew 8, verses 13, the Bible says there, um, Immediately the leprosy was cleansed. And so God wants to do an immediate, amen, uh, uh, in our lives. And so when you begin to study the principle of breakthrough in the, in the Bible, uh, break forth, we, we begin to see that there's two key elements that are significant for your breakthrough. And the first one we looked at last week was and is obedience. And we, we began to see that obedience is not so straightforward because if obedience was so simple and so straightforward, everyone would live in abundance and everyone would live in overflow. However, obedience is not as simple as what we make it out to be or think it is. And so therefore, we must begin to understand then that it's imperative for us to walk in total obedience. Remember, partial obedience is disobedience. And so we cannot only be obedient in the areas that we believe will suit us or we're comfortable in. We have to be obedient in every facet and in every area of our lives. However, this morning, what we want to look at, we want to look at the second facet of breakthrough, of uh, breaking forth, of there being a, 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 an outpouring of God's grace and God's goodness in our lives. And so as you study the Bible, the second area is the concept of sacrifice. And uh, this morning, we want to look at the principle of living a self-sacrificial life. And as you study it in the Bible, you begin to see, as you study the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, very interesting, uh, when you study their lives, you begin to see that every hero of faith had to live a self-sacrificial life. You see, family, we don't live unto ourselves, neither do we die unto ourselves. And, and how we live determines the impact that we will make or have on the next generation. And I believe that it is our responsibility that as we live a, a self-sacrificial life, that when we pass the baton to the next generation, the kingdom of God must be stronger, must be healthier, it must be more equipped, there must be systems and structures in place, there must be facilities in place, the revelation of God must be uh, uh, being manifested. And so for the next generation, it makes it easier for them to go further and do more. And that, that is our assignment. And I thank God for my father, my, my spiritual father, Dr. Basil Tryon. And, you know, uh, he trained me and, and equipped me. And I was under his care and under his training uh, for 18 years. And so he made it so much easier for me that when I was released to plant a church, the foundations were right. You know the Bible teaches in Psalm 11 verse 3, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And, and I thank God that those 18 years of him laying foundations in my life has helped me accomplish so much more in such a shorter period of time. And, and we only nine years as a church, and God has done so much through our ministry, but it's because of ensuring that the foundations are right. But let me say this to you, family. The only reason why he could do so much and he could sacrifice so much is because he lived a self-sacrificial life. And I want to encourage you, that is our responsibility in this generation, is that as we live a self-sacrificial life, we'll be amazed at what God will do in and through our lives. And so let's start and look at the, the word self-sacrifice and what it means. The word self-sacrifice means this. It means sacrifice of oneself or one's interest for others or for a cause or ideal. And so we see that you're sacrificing yourself for others or for a cause or for a worthy ideal. Amen. Now, what is the purpose of living a self-sacrificial life? If you go to me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, reading verses 24, it reads, For if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, you will discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will lose what you try to keep. And so there's two key things here that we find in the scripture about living a self-sacrificial life and the purpose for living this life. Number one, we find that, that you will experience the true glory of God. How amazing is that? That if you begin to live a self-sacrificial life, the glory of God will be manifested in and through your life. And number two, we see there that 
the Bible says here, Luke, Dr. Luke declares that you will discover true life. Amazing family that, that, that when we begin to sacrifice, interesting that as you give more of yourself, God will give more of himself to you. And in you doing so, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is an amazing kingdom. And, and we teach this principle all the time that, that you must never be in the kingdom of God for what you can get. And, and this is so powerful because in this very scripture we see here that if you live a self-sacrificial life, if you live a life not for what you can get, but for what you can give, as you live that self-sacrificial life and keep on giving, amazingly, God says two things, that you will receive his glory and you will experience true life. That is the Zoe life of God. And I tell you something, family, that is an amazing, amazing place to be when you can experience or enjoy true life. So what is a self-sacrificial life? What is a self-sacrificial life? Number one, it is a decision to give up something you want or need so that others can have what they want or need. How amazing is that? Giving up something that you want and even something that you need so that others can have what they want and what they need. Number two, a decision to sow sacrificially into the next generation. You see, family, we are responsible for the next generation. And if we can sow the right seed in the right ground and build the right structures and the right platforms, and when we hand the baton over, the next generation, as I mentioned, will go further and faster and do greater exploits in the kingdom of God. And then thirdly, a decision to sow sacrificially into the kingdom to ensure the kingdom is stronger and healthier. And so that speaks of not only sowing financial seed, but sowing your gift, sowing your wisdom, sowing your knowledge. And the only way you can do that is if you sacrifice your time for the kingdom of God to be a, an empowerment. And family, it starts by being a home cell leader. It starts by being a worker in the church, you know, in the, during the services. It starts by volunteering and helping people. And as you do that, I tell you something, family, you have a, a significant impact or significant influence on people. And, and as we do that, you'll be amazed what God will do through your life. Now, now, why do we have to do this? Why must we be used by God so significantly? As you study the, uh, uh, the stats, and we looked at these stats under building financial systems, you know, these stats are alarming. And, and listen to this. Every day, every day, 25,000 people die from hunger. Every day. The kingdom of God needs you, family. And, and in those stats, 10,000 children die every day. Number two, 40% of people live below 28 rand a day. That's 940 rand a month. How do you survive on, on, on 980 rand a month? And that translates to 544 million people that live below the bread line. Uh, one billion people, that's one eighth of the world's population, which means that one out of eight people in the world don't have safe drinking water. And so you see, family, the kingdom of God needs us because we, 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 know we must be, begin to understand that if I can do what God has called me to do, if I can live a self-sacrificial life, if I can, can, can take hold of the call of God, of the assignment that God has given me, and if I can do my part, you know, family, I, you know, I'm not responsible for what others do. I'm not responsible for the choices that others make but I am responsible for the choices that I make. I am responsible for the way I live. And if I can live a self-sacrificial life, I can assure you one thing, family, God will help you and show himself strong. You know, as a church, over this COVID pandemic, which has been now over 12 months, I tell you something, we, we've made a decision as a church that we're gonna get involved in feeding, and, and you know, family, it hasn't been easy because with the church being closed, it has impacted our finances, and for us to, to distribute the food and, and, and partner in with, with this organization, it has costed us. But, I, but God has been so gracious, because you know when you look at it, for over the last 12 months, we've distributed well over 7,000 hampers. The value of those hampers, uh, of the food that has been distributed, is well over 3 million rand, and, and God has helped us, and we've been had a significant part to play to assist and help people 
over this pandemic. Now, family, you've been in, directly involved, whether you've given one rand or whether you've given your tithes every month or whether you've given offerings or whether you've sown towards that project. You have been a part of that project and God has used us significantly to impact and impart and assist uh, this community, and not just this community, but many, many organizations we've, uh, we have helped. And so, you know, how do I live a self-sacrificial life, Pastor? There's only one way that we live a self-sacrificial life, and that is we have to live by faith. Family, there's no other way. The only way we can live a self-sacrificial life is to live by faith. Now, living by faith sometimes means, number one, even when you don't understand, you still have to walk by faith. You might not have full comprehension. You might not understand where you're going or how you're going to get there, but you have to live by faith. Number two, you have to begin to believe in the invisible or in the unseen. You know, the Bible says, uh, by faith, we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God, that the things that are seen were made by things that are unseen. And so you can have to believe in the unseen. You can have to believe that, that the bend in the road is not the end in the road, that God will show himself strong on your behalf. And then family, if you truly walk by faith, even when no one agrees with you, to even when no one is prepared to walk with you, if you believe that that's what God has, if you believe that that's what God wants to do, if you believe that this is the will of God, then that's living a self-sacrificial life. That I'm going to live, even if I don't understand it, I'm going to walk. Even if I don't have full understanding, I'm going to walk. Even if I don't have people supporting me, I'm going to walk. Even if I can't see it, if it's invisible, I'm going to believe in that that which is impossible or invisible will become possible and will become vis visible in Jesus' name. Now, when you study the Bible, you begin to see some examples of those who lived a self-sacrificial life. And the Bible is littered with men and women that lived a self-sacrificial life. But I want to draw our attention just to two examples this morning. The first one is Esther. And if you go to Esther chapter 4, reading verses 14, the Bible reads, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for a time such as this. And you see, family, the Bible is very clear that if you're not prepared to live a self-sacrificial life, just like this example in Esther, God clearly declares here that God will raise up someone else. But then the Bible goes on to say, but surely know that God has called you for a time such as this. You are called to live a self-sacrificial life. You are called to go the extra mile. You are called to make a difference in the kingdom. You are called to be used by God mightily to establish the rule and the reign of God. And so I declare over your life that God has called you into the kingdom for a time such as this in Jesus' name. And then let's go down to verses 15. It reads, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushim, and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. Then she says this, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. If I perish, I perish. Now, when you study this in the King James, it says, if I die, I die. That's living a self-sacrificial life. Esther knew that her responsibility was to emancipate and release the nation of Israel, the Jews, from the wickedness of the Gentiles. Amen. She, she was clear on her assignment, and she understood that this assignment is so, it's so dangerous because, number one, she did not have any authority to approach the king. The culture of the day was that the women were not allowed to approach the king only on the king's command or order, was she allowed to speak to him? But she made a decision that, I, that in approaching the king, I'm break, breaking protocol, I'm violating authority, but I tell you something, I'm doing this for the sake of the kingdom of God. And if I perish, I perish. You see, family, 
as we embark on a journey of becoming, we're going to go through some extremely challenging trials. We're going to find ourselves in seasons where, like Gideon, we ask, where is this God? Where, like David, David asked, why when there is trouble, you are far from us? You know, family, we're going to go to those seasons, but I want to assure you that God is with you, and God is for you, and those are the signs of living a self-sacrificial life because it is very dangerous and very challenging, very challenging when you live a self-sacrificial life. But I can assure you one thing, God will show himself strong on your behalf. And like Esther, God came through for them and God showed himself strong. The second example I want us to look at today is David's mighty men. How amazing is the story? I tell you, man, let's pick it up in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, reading from verses 17. It reads there, and David said, with longing, oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, David would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, far be it for me, O my God, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of these men who have put their lives in jeopardy? For at the risk of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. Now, this is a very interesting uh, portion of scripture because what we find here is that David just had a desire. Amazing. He had a, de a desire for the waters of uh, Bethlehem. Amen. And, and that was his desire. But interesting, these men just heard his desire and were prepared to sacrifice their lives so that the desire of their king could be fulfilled. You know, family, Jesus' desire, because he is our king of kings, is for us to live a life of sacrifice. It's for us to live a life where when we continue making the right sacrifices in the right environment, which is the kingdom of God, we will see the kingdom flourish, we will see the kingdom expand, we will see the kingdom grow, and we will know that God is on our side. Amen. And so, family, as you see these examples, amen, this, this drink offering was so sacred that David poured it out unto God as a drink offering. And so I want to encourage you as you begin to look at the principles of living a self-sacrificial life, God's heart and God's desire is that in this generation and in this season, we are called to live a self-sacrificial life. Now, let's begin to draw this to a close. What are the benefits of living a self-sacrificial life? What are the benefits? What are the rewards of us living a self-sacrificial life? When you look at this concept, the most and the most significant reward is that we will receive eternal life. Look at Paul declares in Titus chapter 1 verse 2. It says there, which rests on the hope of eternal life. God, who never lies, has promised this before time began. And so Paul declares here that the hope, hope is our future, that we will receive this eternal life. As you live a self-sacrificial life, remember, you're living beyond yourself. John puts it this way, and John teaches extensively on eternal life as you study um, the writings of John. But in John 5, verse 24, it reads, I speak to you an eternal truth. If you embrace my message and believe in the one who sent me, you will never face condemnation. In me, you have already passed from the realm of death into eternal life. I speak to you an eternal truth. So the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will arise with life. For as the Father is the source of life, so he has given the Son the power to impart life. And this is Jesus speaking here. And Jesus is declaring that we have already received, or it has already been imparted to us, 
this eternal life family. And I'll tell you something. You know, this eternal life is, a, is an amazing, amazing experience that you can enjoy right on the earth. Because Paul, uh, John declares here that it's already been given to us. If you look at John 10 verse 28, he declares there, I give to them the gift of eternal life and they will never be lost and no one has power to snatch them out of my hands. And so this this gift of eternal life, it's so powerful. And, and, and when the Bible says we'll never be lost, you see, once we get to heaven and graduate to heaven, there, there is no devil there. There is no enemy there. But, but John is speaking about while you're living on the earth, you can experience this eternal life. And this eternal life, family, God declares that the devil will never be able to snatch you from out of his grasp because this eternal life will begin to work mightily in you. So what is this eternal life, pastor? What does this eternal life entail? Our eternal life, when you study it in the Bible, is speaking of the Zoe life of God. Amen. The Zoe life of God. The Bible declares in John 10 verse 10, it says there, uh, the thief comes in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life that's eternal life, that's the Zoe life, and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. That's the Zoe life. God's heart and God's desire is that whatever you are trusting Him for, not only will you have it, but you'll have it to the full until it overflows. Your relationships, that will be so overwhelmingly uh, full with joy and peace that it'll, it'll bubble over, amen, and impact all those around you in the area of your health. God will give you strength and peace in your health. God will give you strength and, 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 and abundance in your finances. Romans 6 verse 23 declares, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we see that this eternal life is a gift. Now, you know, family, what I understand about a gift is that when a gift is presented to you, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to beg for it. You don't have to ask, you know, what's your motives behind this. When a gift is presented to you, all you have to do is just receive this gift. And as you receive this gift of eternal life, you are receiving the gift of the Zoe life of God. The word Zoe life means superior in quality and super abundant in quantity, amen. And so when you study the meaning of the word Zoe life, this is what it means. It means the rich, abundant, divine nature of God, his fullness of love, joy, power, and ability. And note that all that is available to you. Um, the Bible says in Ezekiel, and this is a prophetic picture of the Zoe life. This is prophesied. The prophet uh, prophesies this for us. Ezekiel 36, 26, he declares, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And so we see that already God, the prophet is, is declaring that the Zoe life is a new heart and a new spirit. And then if you come down into the New Testament, Paul picks it up in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where he declares, now if anyone is enfolded in Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And so family, you have to understand, if you have submitted to Christ, you are fresh and new. The old order is removed. The old life is removed. Amen. You have the eternal life of God, the Zoe life of God in you. And I believe that if you want this life to fully manifest, you're going to have to learn to live a self-sacrificial life. Listen to me. When you study the Bible, the Bible is contrary to a world system. The world declare, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. The, the, the kingdom, the Bible teaches, you know, it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. The Bible says, if you give, it will be given back to you. But the problem that people have is that they don't live by faith. Because as, as long as giving is outside their comfort zone, then they have a challenge with that. And we cannot afford to have a challenge if we know that God would have us live a self-sacrificial life. And so what is the purpose of living the Zoe life? Because there must be purpose to this life. Number one, the Zoe life allows us to live and function according to God's original design. 
When you study the original design of God before the fall, the Bible teaches clearly in Genesis 1, 28, that God has given us a dominion mandate. We created in his image and in his likeness, but we are created to operate or function or have dominion. And so family, we have to understand that we are called to operate with the dominion mandate. 1 Peter 1, 4 declares, we are reborn into a perfect inheritance that can never perish. And so we see that, that this inheritance that we have is perfect. We are reborn into it and it can never perish. However, if we want to walk in that inheritance and if we want to walk in dominion, then we have to walk according to our design. And our design is that we are called to live a self-sacrificial life. Jesus is the pattern son. Jesus is our example. And so we live, are called to live according to the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second purpose of the Zoe life is the Zoe life sets us free from sin and from the clutches of the devil. Amen. It sets us free. The Bible says in John 5, verses 24, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Sin and death has no hold on you when you function in the Zoe life. And number three, the Zoe life empowers us to live life in abundance. It, it, it is the abundance of God. And you know, John 10, 10, the second part declares, but I have come that you may have life to the full until it overflows. Some translations declare that I've come that you might have life and live it abundantly, family. God's heart is for us to live free from oppression. God's heart is for us to live free from poverty. God's heart is for us to live free from hurt and sin. And so this morning, as I draw this to a close, because I want to pray for you this morning, God's desire, as you study the Bible, as you study the patriarchs of old, as you study the heroes of faith, you begin to see a common thread that if you want to live a life of an overcomer, you're going to have to understand that you're going to have to live a self-sacrificial life. The Bible declares, unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. What does that mean? It means that if you prepare to die to self, if it means that you prepare to get to a place in the kingdom where God becomes your only source, where no matter what God demands of you, you are prepared to live a self-sacrificial life. I tell you something, family. In letting go, in releasing that which holds you or binds you, you will find true freedom in God. Remember, the purpose for living a self-sacrificial life is number one, as we looked at, that you will experience the glory of God. And number two, you will experience true life. I pray that over you this morning, that you will experience the glory of God in a new dimension. But number two, you will experience true life in Jesus' name. Allow me to pray for you. Father, as I stretch forth my hands, I declare every family that's listening receives this word by faith. I declare, God, that we will not function by default but we will function by design. And if we want to live in overflow, if we want to experience breakthrough, if we want to break forth, God, then your word declares that we must operate in true obedience, in total obedience. But God, we also need to live a self-sacrificial life. I declare that those that are prepared to live a self-sacrificial life, I pray, God, that, Lord, you will raise them up significantly that men and women will know that they are the true ambassadors of the Most High God. Father, now I command blessings upon your people in the name of the Father and the Son and the precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.